We need more time and space for ourselves for reflection, building self-awareness and resilience. And more importantly, CEOs and HR leaders need to work hard to create those cultures we've talked about to enable employees to lead themselves and others more effectively. The CEOs and HR leaders need to lead by example. And more importantly, all of us, including the CEO and the HR leader, need to be prepared to show that vulnerability and um, courage to ask for help when we need it because we can't do it on our own. Welcome to another episode of the People Hum interview series. I'm your host, Sumita Mariam, and let's begin with a quick introduction of People Hum. People Hum is an end to end, one view integrated human capital management automation platform. The winner of the 2019 Global Cody Award for HCM that is specifically built for crafted employee experiences and the future of work. We run the People Hum blog and video channel, which receives upwards of 200,000 visitors a year, and publish around two interviews with well known names globally every month. And now for our guest, Andrew Talents is the founder and managing partner at the Talents Partnership. He has a wide range of experience of 20 years in leading a team of consultants who delivered a broad range of tailored human capital solutions to multiple industry sectors around the globe. We are extremely happy and honored to have him on our interview series today. Welcome, Andrew. We are so happy to have you here with us. It's nice to be here. Thanks for the invite. A pleasure. So the, the very first question I have for you, let's start with a little bit about your journey so far. What brought you to the Talents Partnership? Sure. I was um, born in Manchester in the UK about 50 years ago. And um, I was uh, born into uh, a council estate, so a hardworking family. My father worked very hard. I was the first generation to go to university. So I was very blessed to, to do that and did well at university. And then I went into the utility industry for a few years and then fell into uh, recruitment um, about 20 years ago. And uh, 20 years ago, recruitment, as people remember, was very competitive, um, is very solutions driven at that point. And I spent 20 years or so working in executive search, recruiting board directors to companies from quite a young age. And what I learned during that 20 years is that every leader is a human being. And every leader, because they're a human being, is held back by certain self-limiting beliefs and fears uh, and other things that get in the way of them being great leaders. So um, about three years ago, um, I became more interested in, in leadership from a coaching perspective. And I had my first uh, coaching session with my coach. I'd never had coaching before until three years ago. And I just found it opened up a whole new world for me in terms of self-awareness and understanding myself more. And that's when I set up my own business, really with a view to helping leaders that I'd worked with in the past and new leaders to actually help them understand themselves better and to be able to fulfill their potential. So, so currently I work with leaders um, who tend to be either already in roles or newly appointed to roles. And I really like working with leaders who want to learn about themselves, want to make a difference in the world, but most importantly, want to learn the importance of self-leadership and self-coaching, which we'll come to talk about later. Um, and my clients um, tend to work on um, their, their teams, their organizations, and hopefully create coaching cultures uh, for their businesses they work for. Yeah, that's wonderful. I mean, what you're doing for the leaders is amazing. Helping them, you know, find out what they have to do and finding out themselves. That's amazing. So. Um, you know, according to you, how can leaders ensure that they have an inclusive and engaged team? Yeah, it's very interesting because I've worked with leaders for, for so long now, and particularly CEOs. When I meet a CEO for the first time, they tend to open up by saying, my team isn't strong enough. Uh, my stakeholders don't understand me. Um, I really need some more different kinds of high quality people to work with. And what I do is really slow the whole conversation down and ask them to actually look at themselves first. So what is it that they're doing that's causing that dysfunctionality of the team? Why is the team not engaged? Why does the, not, the team not feel part of the organization? So what I do is get them to understand first uh, who they are as a leader, which is really difficult. We don't tend to slow down enough to really understand. Sometimes we're afraid to understand who we are as a leader. And more importantly, ask them what their own purpose in life is, not what the purpose of the organization, but what their own purpose is, so that they understand why they're doing what they're doing and get them to really slow down. 
And once they understand that, we can then move on a little bit to who their team are, because again, a lot of leaders don't really understand who their team are. So understanding their team members individually, what their challenges are, what they're like outside of work as well, and really understand what engages them individually. And more importantly, also what their individual purposes are in life. And then once they've got that, they can then start to work with the team, with my support or somebody else's support, to really try and create a common team purpose. So bring all these different purpose together and there's a common team purpose, why we're here. And then from that, they can really set some really clear stretch goals for the team, which motivate and engage the team to work towards their purpose. I think at that point, it's important that each of the team members agree their roles in that team because they'll have different strengths. But more importantly, whatever the role of the leader is, both technically and from a leadership perspective, it's at that point that the leader really needs to be consistent in their leadership style and authentic. Yeah. And that's what creates an engaged team, an inclusive team, because they see a consistent state of leadership. Once a leader is doing that, it's far easier for the leader to hold team members to account in terms of their own roles because they start to feel, well, hold on, the leader's actually doing what they say they're doing. There's a bit more pressure on me now to step up to actually what the cause and purposes of our team. So being clear and consistent, encouraging the team to hold each other to account once the trust builds as well. And actually, this is all very easy to say, but it can only work if the CEO and the actual stakeholders of that organization help to create an environment of psychological safety where you can challenge each other safely knowing there's no retribution for that, yeah. building trust and then confidence in the wider team. So I think that step-by-step -step process can enable teams to become more engaged and inclusive. Yeah, that's a wonderful answer. And I mean, does the role of you know, human resources need to undergo a, a change in organizations today? Where do you think you know, CEOs need to give their HRs more leverage and leeway? It's a really good question. I think it's fair to say that unless you've been very lucky as a human resources leader, usually you are the person that has to try and force the CEO to actually think about people yeah. as opposed to strategy and numbers. And so therefore there's more of a, um, a subservient type of relationship with the CEO and you're always having to try and push. So I think the role of HR does need to change, but the CEO needs to enable that to happen and recognize the importance of that. I truly believe by working with leaders, I've worked out that the future of the organization going forward because of millennials and the younger generation is that we all need to collaborate more effectively. And we need to work differently than maybe we've been doing in the past about individual career prospects, individual career goals that we have to actually helping each other to serve our customers and to serve our stakeholders. So to do this, I think employees need to raise their own self-awareness of who they are, how they impact their tasks and their relationships. And I also think that CEOs and HR leaders need to enable the individual employees to do that. And we need to move a culture from one of training our employees to coaching those employees to be the best possible versions of themselves. And we can only do that by them self-learning, self-developing, self-leading their own development in that. And if employees can self-coach and develop a coaching leadership style, then collaboration will improve because you become more aware of how you impact other people, how you impact relationships, and how you can collaborate and work together to improve the goals that you're working towards. So I think the CEO and HR leaders need to work more closely together to create the space for uh, employees, to create a culture where people feel it's safe to learn and to take some time out and reflect. And the HR leader needs to focus on providing that strategic vision in creating the coaching culture with the CEO leading by example. So in summary, I think the HR leader has three roles. One, to become more proactive with the CEO allowing them to become more proactive in creating the culture. Secondly, they need to create the vision for the coaching culture itself and get the CEO to buy into that. And thirdly, they need to hold the CEO to account in living as a role model that kind of culture that they're creating because that's not easy for the CEO to do that. So there's a supporting mentoring and coaching role that the HR leader can play in relationship with the CEO. So again, easy to say, very difficult to achieve. 
Yeah. So um, we probably covered, you know, most parts of our, of my next question for you. But you know, can you talk a little bit more about you know self leadership and self coaching and why are they why are they relevant? So I was working with a CEO recently who'd been newly promoted into the role of a CEO from a operations director role. And in that role in the first six months, they were starting to blame the board uh, for certain decisions that had been made. They didn't have a strong enough team and her relationship with the chair was not as it should have been. And yet she was acting as a victim and acting uh, in terms of blaming other people. So what self-leadership is all about is taking personal responsibility for what it is that you can control. I can't control what you feel about me. I can't control what other people do. All I can do is influence them. The only person I can control is me in terms of the way I react to things and the things that I do. So the first step of self-leadership is really exploring yourself and who you are and understanding what you can change. Once you start doing that, you can then start to work with other people to help get that coaching that you need to work out your own self-awareness and purpose, and then explore your goals in life, both your personal goals and the goals of the organization. Once you understand who you are, you can then look at the gap between where you are today and who you need to be in the future to achieve your goals. And that's where self-leadership and self-coaching really help because you are working on yourself to actually understand your skills, understand your strengths, understand those weakest areas. Now with this individual, it was the fact that she lacked a bit of confidence in terms of her ability to work with people that were more senior than her. And therefore she worked on building that confidence and building relationships. She didn't wait for them to build the relationships. So that's what we worked on over a 12 month period. And after that period, she was able to self coach her style in terms of self leadership. And she didn't need me anymore in terms of reminding her kind of things she needed to work on. That means she can then lead her team in that way and encourage them to self-lead and self-coach. Yeah, so that, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, uh, you know, that, that really helped us understand the concept. So um, do, you, do you also believe that, you know, organizations need to revamp their performance review processes to, you know, eliminate biases and uh, increase accuracy? I do. I think, again, we're, mo- we're moving from a culture in most organizations of performance management in a negative sense in the sense of identifying who's not performing and offering that carrot and stick to try and incentivize people to behave in a different way to where we're encouraging people again probably in a a thriving coaching culture to understand the task in hand and for them to work out themselves how they actually manage themselves to work towards that task and therefore the actual performance management performance review is all about helping them to understand how they bridge that gap. So if you think about at the moment, a lot of um, CEOs and senior leaders tend to review performance on either a monthly or an annual basis. They'll have a sit down conversation with their employee and what they will do is actually give them feedback on how they've been performing. But what that doesn't do is actually catch in the moment how they're performing. It just does it as a series of intervals. So for me, again, a really good performance review process enables that self-leadership to take place by understanding where the person is now, where they want to get to in their career, what are the goals that are being set by the organization, and get them to own their own personal development and use both feedback and the Marshall Goldsmith concept of feed forward to actually in the moment enable that rich learning to take place. So actually moving from an interval type of performance review to actually an instantaneous in the moment performance review so that people can learn instantly. That creates clear accountability. And it also means that you can measure and improve it very easily. And that leads to higher emotional intelligence in people. Wow. I think you can also introduce gamification as well. So I've, um, I've come across this in some organizations where if you can introduce that gamification element of actually setting targets for people where they've identified a career goal or a, a way to improve themselves that they own, and actually having some sort of competition internally around that as well and helping each other. And then finally, what I would say is that some kind of buddy system can work quite well in uh, performance reviews, learning from other people about how they've overcome certain challenges. And finally, I think it's about supporting the employee to help themselves in any performance review process. It's all about them owning it and you providing that support to them. And I know technology can enable this. Wow, 
Wow, that's a beautifully structured answer. I love it. And thank you. Uh, you know, um, resiliency is the new mantra during these trying times, right? So, how would you advise organizations to build more resiliency in their cultures? How can we be more resilient? It's a very good question, and a lot of organizations are looking at this now. It links back a little bit what to us saying before, and Google has done some studies on this. You know, if we actually can, uh, as an organization, firstly create that culture of psychological safety, which means that if I think I can see something that I don't think is right for the organization, or you're behaving in a certain way that I don't think is appropriate, I need to feel safe to be able to call that out and to challenge you on it. So I think that's the first thing that culture needs to be able to do. I think the second thing then, and this is very hard for organizations to do, is for the CEO and the HR leader to create an environment where each employee is not um, disrespected for creating space and time for themselves to reflect. Reflect on what they've just done, reflect on how they impact what they're doing, and build that self-awareness again, as opposed to moving from meeting to meeting to meeting to meeting, particularly in this remote environment we're in now of constant Zoom meetings, enable people to have space and time to reflect. And again, that enables them to build resilience. I think the next thing is about well-being, and it's linked into that. So if we understand more about our self-awareness and what we need to feel good and to feel that we are um, healthy, both in mind and body, then that's important. And it's also important that we ensure that employees have personal development plans linked through the performance review that understand their role, their purpose, and how they're held to account around that. I think that's very, very important. And then finally, I think incentivizing employees to develop that self-leadership discipline and take personal responsibility for the tasks they have to do and the relationships they need to create. All of this builds resilience in individuals and it's only the HR lead and the CEO that can actually create this kind of environment and they need to demonstrate resilience themselves. So to live all of this. And what I find the disconnect is, is that HR leadership is trying to create this kind of culture but the CEO is not available to anybody because they don't create space and time for themselves and because they're running from meeting to meeting to meeting and they're not displaying the resilience. And that's the disconnect sometimes. So I think that's the best way that um, HR leaders can support CEOs. Yeah, I think that is, you know, there's this clash between the HRs thinking about, you know, some well-being and, you know, the, the other organizational, you know, the management thing, thinking as an economist and thinking of wealth creation. So I think it collides and, you know, it makes some trouble right there. So uh, that was a wonderful answer, Andrew. And, you know, just to kind of wrap up the interview process, if you have any last sound bites that you would like to leave our audience. Yeah, I think it's just to summarize what we've been talking about, really. I think what COVID has done is it's changed the world for good in the way that we work together and the way we look at each other and the way we review performance. So for me, it's all about recognizing that we all need to collaborate more effectively now than we've ever done before, both in our organizations, but to create a sustainable world for all of us. I think we need to understand who we are and so we can understand others better as well. We need to demonstrate self-leadership so that we fulfill our own potential. And in the process, we can then help others to fulfill their own potential because we understand them more effectively. We need more time and space for ourselves for reflection, building self-awareness and resilience. And more importantly, CEOs and HR leaders need to work hard to create those cultures we've talked about to enable employees to lead themselves and others more effectively. The CEOs and HR leaders need to lead by example. And more importantly, all of us, including the CEO and the HR leader, need to be prepared to show that vulnerability and um, courage to ask for help when we need it because we can't do it on our own. Yeah, that's wonderful. Yes, thank you so much for that answer. And I, thanks for that last dose of positivity in the last answer. And uh, thank you so much, Andrew, for being with us in this, you know, in this trying times and giving your time and energy for our audience. We are really grateful for you for your time. And it's been a totally enriching experience for me personally, and I'm sure it will be for our audience also. And have a healthy and safe time ahead of you. I'll keep in touch with you and stay safe. Thank you for the opportunity. Keep safe. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.